Hey everyone, thanks for joining. We're excited to have everyone here. Uh, we're going to have a really great discussion. As she said, we're talking about managing healthcare cyber threats and protecting patient data at the edge. And it's become so important, right? If we don't protect the patient's data, then patients won't trust us. They won't trust us to give us the data that we need to be able to care for them. So hopefully we can have a great discussion here and thanks everyone for joining live. I'm John Lynn, the founder, chief editor at Healthcare IT Today and I'll be moderating this discussion and we have a great panel here as well. And if you're watching here live and you have any questions, give me the universal you know, half hand raise and uh, you know, happy to incorporate any of your questions, any of your comments as well. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, we'll go ahead and have each of our panelists introduce themselves so you want to start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the uh, kicking us off with the introductions, and thanks for Dell for having me. I'm truly excited to be here. My name is Joe Bocas, also known as the Wearables Expert. I'm a global digital health influencer and also the CEO of uh, Digital Salutum. And at Digital Salutum, we are on a mission to make healthcare uncomplicated by transcending the barriers to human health. Truly excited about the discussion. Looking forward to interact with everybody. Many thanks. Thanks, Joe. Krista? All right, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Krista McFarlane. Um, I'm also a HIMSS digital influencer, as well as the founder and CEO of Patientory. Um, we're pretty much on the cutting edge. So we're a patient engagement um, and data analytics platform that utilize decentralized technology, such as blockchain, to aggregate patient health information, You know, really empower um, our users and consumers with access to their data to be able to share that. Um, and we've also created the world's first healthcare cryptocurrency uh, about seven years ago that integrates with our blockchain network. Well, blockchain's gonna solve all the security issues, right? Now, maybe we'll get into that. <laughs> Drex? Uh, I'm Drex DeFord. I'm the executive healthcare strategist at CrowdStrike. I'm a long time recovering CIO uh, from the US Air Force, Scripps Health, Seattle Children's, Stewart Healthcare in Boston. Good morning. I'm really glad to be here. I think this will be a fun, interesting panel. Yeah, thanks for being here, Drex. Steve? And I'm Stephen Laser. I am the uh, Director of uh, Technology and Innovation for our Healthcare and Life Sciences team from Dell Technologies and uh, work with a group of folks that are absolutely amazing from all over the world. We'll be taking utilized Dell Technologies intellectual property to go ahead and create those healthcare solutions that you see in the market today. Excellent. Thanks so much. And everyone that's watching, if you're uh, live tweeting this as well, you can uh, s be sure to include the hymns 22 hashtag. Or also, uh, Dell has a great hashtag, uh, Transform HIT. So be sure to check that out. They share lots of great content as well. Well, Steve, you have the mic. So how about you start us off, right? Is, is ransomware and other security concerns, are they really causing you know patients not to trust the, their health data. So that's a really interesting discussion point and John thank you very much for the question but patients are at a point where they're just starting to question whether or not we can be able to protect their data appropriately uh, and as we start to see the world expand into the the devices of the world those medical IOT devices those non-medical IOT devices and where we're collecting that data from we're starting to see not only patients but clinicians healthcare systems really starting to wonder whether or not they can trust the data. This brings up the discussion of data confidence fabrics that we can get into a little bit deeper. I don't want to go too deep on this discussion, but as you start to look at it, how do you get to a point where you can trust the data coming from a device directly? Uh, as you see the advent of things like 5G capabilities, where we have devices that automatically and will repeatedly share information directly, how do we make sure that that information stream is accurate, true, coming from the place we expect it to come from and going to the place we expect it to go to. Yeah, great. Uh, Chris, do you want to chime in? I mean, Patient Tory is the company, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, there we go. Yeah, let's, let's hear, you know, what's your perspective on patients and trusting the data? Yeah, and you know, this is one of the core reasons why, um, you know, my team and I went and we founded this company because, you know, there is the lack of patient trust, but also the lack of patient engagement, you know, currently in, in healthcare today. Um, we think it's important to definitely empower users and we can do that by actually giving them ownership of that information. Um, putting it on a decentralized system um, such as blockchain, you know, we're built, essentially building a trust framework, right? Um, you know exactly you know, where transactions are, are, are happening and, and where it's coming from. Um, so there's definitely more 
you know, inherent transparency. Um, but also on the, on the consumer side, looking from a, a consumer front today, you know, consumers trust big brands like Apple or, or Google with their data more than they do a health system. Um, and it's really looking at, you know, how can we really change that narrative and, and you know, empower those users. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, immutable record sounds great. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of health systems that aren't immutable <laughs> records. They change. Uh, Drex, I mean, you've seen the the evolution. As you said, you're, you're the recovering CIO. I'm wondering if he's ever going to recover, but that's a different story. Uh, no, but, it, you know, how has it evolved, right? I mean, when you were first CIO, it was really just let's make sure the internet's on. Now the responsibility of a CIO is so much more. So how do you see this? It's really changed a lot. If you think back to um, the sort of the beginning, uh, say 2008, 2009, right when we first passed ARRA, uh, maybe 10% of health systems had electronic health records. With ARRA and $40 billion, 95% had electronic health records. We did it in a big hurry. And so I think there were a lot of cybersecurity things that weren't necessarily done. And as we read a lot of studies today, patients are saying things like, I'm a little concerned about giving all my information to my doctor because I don't know ultimately what's going to happen with that information, with ransomware and everything else. So um, yeah, patients are definitely concerned about giving up that data and making sure that it stays secure. Yeah, Joe, so we'll, we'll have you hop in, but let's expand it. I mean, you can certainly address patient trust, but uh, as you look forward, I mean, you're the wearable guy. <laughs> you're the expert on this, right? And, and we've seen an explosion of these IoT devices, which from one perspective is like, great. That means we have a lot more data to be able to be more specific in how we treat a patient. But on the other side, it's like that's a big security risk. So what would you add on that? And how do we address the both sides of that? Yeah, sure. I mean, healthcare is uh, very peculiar, like no other industry with a lot of complexity. And certainly wearables, I love wearables. I'm an advocate of wearables. Certain wearables bring a lot of value, bring a lot of data, but also bring more complexity to the existing complexities. And also, uh, because um, bringing different data access, access points to integration, they, they also make the healthcare systems more vulnerable. And I'll give you an example. For example, if you are a clinician and you want to put uh, medical device data through, you have to connect with your existing platforms or existing places. And clinicians often log in several times a day. And if you add wearables and medical devices, they will bring that data somewhere, somehow, more often. So what I really want to say with that is that um, basically is more space for accidents and cyber attacks to happen through different places. And let me give you a very peculiar example. I was at one cybersecurity data event with another brand in London a while ago, and I'm not a cybersecurity expert by any means, but this cybersecurity gentleman gave gave a talk and he said that the hackers uh, act actually access and they have an attack through a fish tank because they had an IoT device. And we're not even talking about like the wearables or the medical device, we're talking about somewhere else. So, so no more fish tanks in healthcare? No more that? fish tanks connected <laughs> to healthcare. The, and also I'll give you an example, I don't want to mention brands, but Garmin uh, during the pandemic about 12 months ago got a cyber attack and they spent a randomware attack and they spent a lot of money to fix it and it took them two days. I heard they paid $10 million to fix the issue and it took two days and they have a lot of users. I'm not promoting Garmin whatsoever or any brands. I'm staying agnostic as an influencer and, and person in healthcare, but that's an example. And now we're seeing more cyber attacks, I mean, in all industries, but healthcare specifically is more prone to cyber attacks. So how do we ensure that we trust that data? I mean, you know, like, I think that's the fear that we have, uh, you know, and Steve brought up the interesting point, right? Like, does it need to be directly connected through 5G, which has more security than maybe other options? Or what are your thoughts on how do we ensure that we trust the data? Sure. Well, Certainly having secure systems, integration, what I've been seeing a lot if in wearables and bringing data is that people try to use like a data integrator 
but what works in terms of security best is to do integration by by one by one wearable is more secure you also have that solidity of bringing that system right in but also we are advancing in terms of technologies now and we are here to discuss the edge for example and the edge gives us another layer of security but also securing the data at the edge wherever wherever you are so um yeah, is a lot of potential there. Is a kind of a pre preventative measure, but also a secured measure to rely on the data to stay secure at the point of entry. Drex, anything you'd add as far as how do we secure all of these IoT devices and how do we make sure that they're secured so we can trust the data? Yeah, I think this is a challenge that I've had since I was, you know, a baby lieutenant back in the Air Force. We had uh, always had medical device issues. They're brittle, they have odd operating systems that are built just for that piece of equipment to run. They're not usually patchable. A lot of times they're not patchable because they don't run standard problem. operating systems. And so today, one of the best ways to do that is to segment those devices on their own part of the network so that you can watch those devices and see if they have odd behavior. And then there are some really great vendors down in the 300 pavilion who do uh, medical device, IOT, IOMT security stuff. And that's really kind of the cutting edge today, putting sensors on the network, watching that traffic go by, understanding what you have on the network so that you can understand how to protect it if you can and what your vul vulnerabilities are if you can. Yeah. That's great. Steve, I mean, you mentioned the data confidence fabric. Tell us more about what you're thinking there. There are a couple of different conversations around the data confidence approaches and first of all is being able to verify source and target of the data and making sure that it's appropriately tagged and appropriately marked as it transfers throughout whatever system that is. The other half of that conversation is a networking and communication system that we'll utilize to transfer that data. And as you start to look at where things are going from a communications perspective, especially in the 5G network, you're going to find that there will eventually become a healthcare spectrum eventually it's not here yet it is on the horizon and through as a part of that healthcare spectrum for communication it will become highly protected and highly secured at least in this country as we go outside the, this country those opportunities still exist those 5g bandwidth is so wide and provides so many opportunities that if we pr properly protect it as we start this process it will give us the opportunity to have that secure communication do we have to wait for 5G though? I mean that, like, and, and maybe this is a U.S. perspective because we, we have 5G in a lot of areas here, but uh, you know, a lot of places don't. <laughs> Many places do not have 5G yet. Um, the other option is we start at the device creation side of things and being able to provide security in the device creation so when its data is generated, if it's communicating independently, we need to be able to provide it right at that point of data generation. If it's communicating and dependent upon some other device, to share its data, how do we bring that data into a secured environment, assure that it is appropriate once again, that it is uh, within the parameters of, again, where it started, where it's going, what its, um, what its payload is from a data communications perspective, and look at it from that point of view, and making sure that we have it in the right place. Uh, that's great. So everyone watching live, if you have any questions, definitely just raise a hand. We're happy to have any questions or comments from the audience as well. So always happy to have an involvement. But Chris, let's you know shift gears a little bit. Like, so we have this wave of data that we want patients to trust, right? And we need to be able to trust it too. But I think there's an interesting balance as we do it, right? Because you know, there's a, also the challenges of freedom. <laughs> you know, do I want that data shared and privacy, right? Like, where do I want it shared? So how do you look at that? You know, the explosion of it, but making sure it's private the way the patient wants it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've been hearing this past week that healthcare is now at, you know, we're at the digital front door, right? And what does this mean? What we does this mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does this mean when that door is open and we go through it, right? Um, you know, endless possibilities for sure. You know, this is how we can enter into that age of, you know, healthcare consumerization. You know that that has been tooted around for um, the past five or so years, 
Um, but ensuring that, you know, it, 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 the security is great. Um, what we also have to look at, which we'll get into um, later, is, you know, standards. You know, how can we create that confidence um, in this space? Um, and, and what's good, I'm going back to blockchain and decentralization, is, you know, this can happen at scale when we look at b big data, um, you know, creating smart contracts to really automate it and track, you what's know. What's a smart contract? <laughs> <laughs> For those good, that don't good, know. good question. So, a, a smart contract is essentially um, it's a, a code that can be created, you know, within a blockchain infrastructure um, that accounts for um, transactions. So, you know, if I want A to happen, I can create a smart tra contract for for that to happen. But also, it, it's great, great, great for tracking as well. Um, so, when you look at scalable systems, you know, you know, having you know, these smart contracts in place to be able to track, you know, if there's a fault at, 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 at any means or um, within the system, you know, we'll, we'll start to be able to, to understand and, and track how that happens. Um, but along with that, of course, we have to, you know, really start to look at um, how we're creating standards around not only, you know, the origin of the, the information, but, but also how it is also tracked across um, the network. Well, it's interesting that a lot of standards don't track origin, which is it's a fascinating point. Drex, uh, did you want to add? Well, so I was just thinking, I don't know, I might be the old guy up here. I'm not sure. But. Is it a battle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. But thinking back again, kind of to the old days, when I first started as a CIO, you know, we had systems from lots of different vendors that we figured out how to put together through interface engines. And then over time, we decided that we would have a centralized database and put all the data there. With all of these things, there's pros and cons. And one of the cons was that all the data was in one place, right? A little so, honeypot for the hacker. Exactly. Huh? And so one of the, I mean, I think the idea of blockchain and where you're going with blockchain and where we're going today with a lot of our technology is there's still a centralized database, but it, those EHR companies aren't necessarily the companies that are building all of the, the user interface part of how doctors and nurses interact with that data. So there's an evolution, and I think you're on the right track, and it gives patients a lot more control of their data and how they want to participate in things like clinical research studies and all, the, all that kind of stuff. So Joe, I mean, you come from the land of Europe, GDPR, <laughs> which has a little different perspective, I think. So how would, what layer would you add to this as far as keeping patients' data private and ensuring, you know, th but it's still allowing them the freedom to share it where they need it? Yeah, sure. Well, I think GDPR is actually an improvement and is certainly necessary in terms of creating some standards of security and, and protecting people in general. Um, health data is different than other personal data. Personally, this is just my point of view. I don't actually mind sharing my steps and, and I don't see actually the downside. But in terms, when it comes to the other side of patient data that is actually more personalized around the critical issue, it's, it's very, uh, I mean, it's sensitive, right? So I think what, I, what I've been noticing is actually in terms of empowering the patient, and I've been in a lot of conversations, ethics comes to play and when clinical research is mentioned for example if you explain from the outset in terms of good open communication that using my data for for example a research around cancer people respond really well i read some research that pardon me about 80 percent of um, patients don't mind sharing their data but if you, on the other hand, saying, actually, I'm going to use your data for a pharma company, and sorry to play devil's advocate in here, <laughs> but for a pharma company, they already make billions and millions, but they're going to use it for some cause, maybe people are really skeptical. So it's always the two sides of, of the coin. But GDPR is in place now. It kind of protects us from one hand, but also probably stops the industry from doing more things at the same time. So it's always a give and take. And uh, Rex mentioned before about the pros and cons. Nothing is like a 100% clear cut that we should really do it that way. So, Yeah, Steve, you were nodding your head at ethics. I got to hear what you were thinking there. Uh, nodding my head not only at ethics, but also at responsibility and looking at how we utilize this data. Um, and not to bring this forward as a uh, commercial conversation, but 
from a Dell Technologies perspective, we support the I2B2 Transmart Foundation very significantly, uh, including developing that from a COVID long, COVID long haul research perspective. Uh, and with that, the ability to share data is what's bringing us information, the ability to share data freely. Now, without that and without some capabilities around things like synthetic data, not possible to do and still be able to protect privacy, be able to provide that uh, responsibility around that data and really utilize it, utilize data in an ethical, responsible manner. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, you know, I'm surprised in our conversation, no one's mentioned AI yet, which as I look at it, we're looking at the volume of data, right? Hackers love when there's a volume of data that basically you can't see what's happening. <laughs> they can hide behind all of that volume of data. So what's, how is AI going to play into this, whether it's you know, obviously getting value out of the data, that's a discussion you know, worth having as well, but also in protecting the data because the volume's so high that it's like, how do I even know what's legitimate and what's a hacker just hiding under the, you know, it amidst the, you know, it was a needle in a haystack, if you will, right? So, And I'll go ahead and get, give us a start on this, but then I'm going to hand it over to Drew here. And with that, many of the many of the tools that we see already have AI embedded in them as a way to be able to surface information because there's such a volume of information that's coming in, whether it's from a uh, networking perspective, whether it's from a, uh, a firewall perspective, and we're, how we're looking at that data, how data is utilized, its source, its target, its direction of travel, its pathway of travel, and how do we utilize things like AI to surface the information around that data to show where it's been, where it's going, and what is different about it today. Uh, there are tool sets out there that will do things like understand what is a normal traffic pattern, be able to go ahead and uh, look at that traffic pattern, and perhaps we find that our MRI is communicating with China at 3 a.m. every night. How do we go ahead and utilize AI to detect it, number one, but also automatically implement a firewall rule to stop that communication at 3 a.m. until we deal with it? And with that, Drex? I'm really glad you asked that question. <laughs> oh, good. I know you love AI. I mean, this is really are what we. Are you an AI? Yeah, <laughs> this is really what we do. We are we are essentially a big data analytics company that does artificial intelligence and machine learning on top of the data that we pull from endpoints. Wait, so CrowdStrike, a security company, is an AI company? That's actually fascinating. Yeah. That really, an analytics company. There are so we deploy a lightweight sensor to all the endpoints in any given environment, and that endpoint sensor sends data real time streams it up to the cloud and we have ml engines running on top of that cloud that are looking for all kinds of patterns of behavior that we know are the way that adversaries act and behave and as soon as we see that we can usually identify it within about a minute of it starting we can do an investigation in about 10 minutes we can recover the system put it back in service in, in about an hour less than an hour but that's important because what we've sort of figured out over time is that the adversary takes about an hour and 38 minutes to move from the first machine to the second machine. Uh, that lateral movement means you have a much bigger event on your hands. And so ultimately it comes down to if you can find them and kill them fast enough, you don't have to worry about ransomware or data exfiltration that's associated with ransomware. And that's, I mean, that's essentially what we do. Yeah, no, that's powerful. Joe, maybe you can give us more of the the patient perspective, right? And how does it impact them, right? And 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 how is AI going to help make meaning out of all this data, right? I mean, it's great that we give all the security logs. At least we're finally tracking the security logs. But we needed the AI on top of it to know what did those logs matter. The same is true with health data, right? I mean, you know, what, what's your perspective on it? Sure, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned AI. Uh, my mind was, I'm very conservative when people talk about AI in these days. Sure, and it's more because, machine learning often. <laughs> because, because for a few years, everybody is in the world, but very little work has been done so far. And now I think we're entering a different era that actually things are starting to get done. But uh, also, let me bring the wearables into the equation because they're really important. Yeah? They bring the data. They are the vehicle that brings the data in and then... And my vision is that the combination of wearables and AI will be the true game changer in healthcare. But going back to your question about the patient and the value, 
the value is AI scrutinizing what is important and we know that clinicians don't have time to go through the data. Is, is no point going to the clinician with your Fitbit or your health data from the last week because the reality is well, if you get in these days, if we're not talking about virtual care, but if you get an appointment with a clinician, on average, you have eight to 10 minutes to talk to your clinician. And this certainly is not gonna analyze your data from last week or last month. So AI in here plays a crucial, uh, very important role in highlighting maybe one piece of health data that is important that you can focus on, whether there is your sleep, your heart rate, whatever that is meaningful, personalized and important to you that you can bring to the table right away. And I think that's where AI really bring a lot of value in scrutinizing and analyzing and bringing to the forefront of the equation what is really important to you in this case. Chris, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this as well. And I, I'm interested to hear how AI works with blockchain because blockchain in many ways can make AI, AI more challenging. So I'd love to hear what you think about it. No, absolutely. In our first iteration of our um, technology stack, we had to really figure out you know, how are we building a, a more, you know, distributed ecosystem? And while we're blockchain enabled, you know, we realize that having a storage um, infrastructure as well to be able to, um, you know, analyze and, you know, start to build a lot of these intelligence systems within that data set um, is important. Um, but just looking at, you know, past history and in terms of ransomware, you know, we know that healthcare data is five times as more valuable than our credit card information. Right, and and we see the credit bureaus that that's also you know in the same position as, as healthcare enterprises that have gone through, you know these attacks, um, and most of them you know fail to to notify the actual consumer in time, right? No, for sure. Right? Um, I think I have twelve credit monitoring services or something. <laughs> exactly. So, so it's really looking at it from a standpoint of you know how are we you know putting that individual in control of that information with our system. You know we use self sovereign identity. You know, the, the, you know, put private public key encryption um, that helps. Um, and I think, you know, by using these, you know, intelligence, you know, that can also help in alerting um, individuals on that aspect. So what do you think, Chris, and we'll stay with you, but uh, what, what will be the impact if we don't protect patient data? Like, you know, like how, how you know, what's the future look like for an organization that doesn't invest in protecting the data? Yeah, no, and, and I like to think this concept of, um, you know, we're not consumer first until we're, you know, technology first, right? So how are we really, you know, safeguarding our infrastructure and technology to be able to meet the needs of um, the market and um, individuals? Um, and I would say, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a definitely a value chain. So if we don't have, you know, a healthy infrastructure, you know, we don't have healthy health outcomes. Um, and, you know, by really employing, you know, technology first is where we can start to see, you know, more of the, the improvements in, in, in the health industry. Steve, how would you describe, I mean, you work with hundreds of organizations at Dell Technologies and you've seen probably the good, the bad and the ugly. So what's it mean when, they, when they're not protecting it and what's it like when they haven't? Uh, when they're not protecting the information, you lose the trust of the consumer. It can mean loss of brand or even loss of business, quite frankly. I mean, totally out of business. Well, and it's gone from one day downtime or an hour downtime, you know, yes. to now, what was it, six months for one organization yes. recently? That, that, that particular one, yes. It was several months of, uh, of time to recover. Worked with other organizations that have been infiltrated in the past. And the lot, number one, the loss of brand and the loss of trust of your consumers will drive your consumers away. And with that, you're out of business very quickly. Uh, that's the one to keep in mind. If you can continue to maintain consumer trust, if you can continue to maintain the uh, trust of the brand itself, that's absolutely key in being able to continue business. Going from there, being able to show that you've protected your patient's data and be able to show that you have done everything within your power to be able to protect them and support them should something happen is the next layer going up. And we can continue on up the stack as we talk about this. But this is all about, re this is all about recovery of that brand in this case. Yeah, it's shocking to me how many things in healthcare we could solve or improve if we just actually cared. <laughs> like, I mean, that's kind of what you said. You're like, show that we made a sincere effort to secure the data 
you know, it's like basically saying, yeah, I actually care about security and I'm going to invest in it. That's kind of what you said, right? Well, it, yes, it's about investment, but it's not just investment in technology. It's investment in your people. It's investment in your process and understanding yeah, what you're going to be doing. Um, you know, 70% of security breaches start with people right there. So how do you train your people? How do you test your people? How do you validate that your people are doing the best of the, that they can do to keep your data private, to keep your data secure? Even at Dell Technologies, I get internal phishing attempts on a regular basis. And guess what? If you fail too many of those tests, you're going to get some remedial training. That's all there is to it. And, and I don't see it as a negative. I see it as a positive in that it keeps our team on their toes just a little bit. It can't be overzealous, it can't be overdone, but at the same time, it needs to be there as part of that overall process. And then what happens if something does get infected? How do we take it from there? What happens? How do you get help? How do you train your users, your end users, to spot something? Or if, they've, if they get the blue screen that says we've now encrypted your device, what do they do? What is the process they follow? How do they contact the right support people? Yeah, is there shame I mean, if they do admit that they did it, right? Uh, I've seen that one a lot. Yeah, the shame part of it is a challenge, I agree. At the same time, the best thing that they can do is to work with the organization, have a known process, and that there is no retribution for having clicked on whatever link it was. Yeah, absolutely. Were you uh, chiming in, Yeah, actually, I want to take the momentum and thank, sh thank you for mentioning people because, I mean, healthcare is all about people. I mean, any business, any industry is, is always about people, but healthcare is certainly all about people, from the patient, from the clinician, from the technology, people behind technology. And you mentioned very important points there, Steve, and... and we, we focus a lot on the technology in these days, but we forget that behind technology is people, behind security is people, there are the processes, there are the businesses. And you mentioned something really important. Anyone is prone to an attack, but the cost of a cyber attack could be out of business. And out of business is, <laughs> I mean, there's no price tag on that. But what I also would like to move on quickly is give another insight about what is um, in terms of patient patient security p people that feel at ease if they know that actually they're in the right hands and that adds value to the business but also adds value to enable what is important in healthcare which is the connectivity and the connectivity i'm not talking about the technology in here i'm talking about the connecting the the human side the values the trust and trust Trust is key. Drex? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does ultimately come back to patients and families. And when you think about where most healthcare is delivered in the country, a lot of them in rural and small towns, and you know, they have one hospital within 150 miles. When those hospitals are attacked, or they go down with ransomware, or whatever the case may be, those hospitals go out of business. Your heart attack now has to go 300 miles or 400 miles to get to the nearest hospital. So it's hard to deliver good modern healthcare today without technology systems being up and running and in place. And, and that ultimately is, you know, the, the cybersecurity business, making sure that we can keep those hospitals up and running to take yeah. care of patients and families. So we talked about the downside drugs, but let's talk about a few things and we'll go down the line on this, I think. And what are a few suggestions of what can people do to avoid this fate, right? <laughs> to avoid this fate, I, again, I'm going to come back to the people process technology conversation that I started with and that it's not just about the technology. Technology is the supporting enabler to make all this happen. Utilizing the right technology, training your people in it, training them in the process and reiterating that, keeping them on their toes a little bit and really enabling those capabilities so that we don't have concerns about what happens if, we just know what to do. Excellent. Drex, what, what advice would you give a CIO? Yeah, I think, you know, start with an incident response retainer when it comes to cybersecurity. Make sure that you have a connection to a company that is really great at what they do when it comes to reacting to cyber incidents. Um, they've done it in a lot of places, they've seen all the things, and it gives you a sense of calm when you have that connection. You have a ticket to the front of the line, because when the stuff hits the fan, it usually hits the fan in 100 places at the same time. 
you want to make sure you have a ticket to the front of the line and that's what incident response retainers are all about i mean start there there's so many things all the hygiene things that we talk about all the time but if you start with an incident response retainer you know you're covered should the worst day in your life be tomorrow and I, I mean these days it's not a should it's when it feels yeah, like yeah, for yeah. most organizations i look at the hhs wall of shame as we call it and if you're not on it i actually am more concerned about you because that means you're probably not watching so yeah, i get more good yeah that means oh you've been breached and you have no idea probably but anyway chris well, how about yourself yeah no i i challenge healthcare organization cios to to stay abreast of the market you know a lot of the ransomware attacks that we see now are using you know, advance um, technologies, cryptocurrency to hold data um, ransom. So, you know, how are how are you know organizations and leaders really investing in the necessary research um, and innovations to make sure that you know they're also you know employing the the, the safe measures and then the guards needed to to really keep their organizations healthy. So, should they own cryptocurrency? That I mean, this is an interesting <laughs> security question. No, I mean it's a fair question. If you want to pay the ransom and you don't have a cryptocurrency account, you can't. Now, we could argue should you or not, but any thoughts? Do we want to go there? Drex? Um, <laughs> go ahead, Chris. I don't really comment on investment vehicles, but <laughs> hey. Uh, it shouldn't be an investment. That's it's a, it's a speculatory <laughs> uh, investment, right? No, I mean, it's kind of funny that you say that because several years ago, I had a friend call me and they were going through a ransomware attack. I didn't work at CrowdStrike at the time. But it turned out that they wound up paying their ransom and they paid it because the CFO's son had a Bitcoin account and that's how they were able to get it out. So, yeah, all of these things, I mean, I think when you do an incident response retainer and you start to have the conversations with those companies about all the things you need to have to be prepared, I'm sure that is part of the conversation. If you decide, we wouldn't advocate it, but if you decided to do that, it's a business decision. How does that payment happen? How do you negotiate the final deal? All of that is a big part of just being prepared. Does that change the conversation with your board when you start saying, hey, we need an in incident response retainer and uh, you know, maybe we need a crypto account? Because the board then has to say, wait, I need an incident response retainer you know, because I think a lot of CISOs think I have to be perfect, right? Yeah. And so when we're doing security, we're like, yeah, we have to be perfect every time. They just have to be perfect once, right? I mean, the trite phrase that we've heard, yeah. you know, but the board thinks, no, you should be perfect. We, you know, and a lot of times, especially in this environment, the board has gone and said, here's your blank check or nearly blank check. Tell us what you need and we will do it because we don't want to hear from you again. But, you know, you're kind of bringing up a different point, which is like, hey, you may give us a blank check and we may still have a problem. Yeah, I think, you know, if if your board thinks <clears throat> that you're bulletproof, then you haven't been having the right conversations with your board. You haven't been exposing them to the right information. You haven't been um, explaining to them that you can put the pickets closer together and you can make them taller. But you, they're, they're never going to be airtight, right? Deeper, wider moats and taller castle walls are not the answer to this problem ultimately. It's about speed and you have to be prepared to deal with incidents because they may very well happen. They may not turn into breaches, sure. but you need to be, be able small. to catch them quickly and fix them quickly, yeah. Yeah, Joe? Yeah, sure. Uh, in my case, I wouldn't like to go to the, to the line of the creep correct currency because I'm completely out of my dev. <laughs> But, know, uh, but where's, what the, where's the Joe NFT? I want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I work in technology and digital. Uh, but also, I would say common sense prevails, right? I mean, in terms of business intelligence and recovery, I would say if I was on a board or a CIO of a very large uh, company, I would say I would take inventory straight away and see what is in place and what is not and what you need to be addressed. And also I would correlate that with healthcare in general. Prevention is better than cure. And I will use, use that approach and see what I can do to prevent a cyber attack and to actually take measures when I can instead of going try to fix it, a very costly thing. So common sense. is not so common. <laughs> yeah, it's not so common because no, this, is, this is the crazy thing, for example. You talk about, I'll give you an example. If you talk about insurance, in US it's slightly different, but in Europe, if you talk about insurance, people are very 
pragmatic about getting insurance, for example, health insurance, because you're paying for something that has not happened yet, right? And in here is a similar thing. You're paying for a preventative measure that is not happened yet, but it's actually is much better to pay for prevention than cure. But in healthcare, we always is a fixing industry, isn't it? In terms of the delivery, we're fixing when we have a problem. And this is also very linked to human race uh, mindsets. Uh, we, we as human beings, and I'm generalizing, don't take this personal, please. We as human beings don't really operate like that. We operate in a, in a way that when we have a problem, we deal with it. I'm not going to kind of, I'm going to prevent an attack in three years time. Actually, I'm going to do some funeral insurance when I'm in my 30s. I, I, I have not seen anyone doing that yet. I don't have it yet. No, I'm not in my 30s <laughs> She's the only one. I'm not in my 30s, by the way. But. No, it's a good point, right? In your comparison, maybe we need to go to all these other health IT vendors here at HIMSS who are motivating patients to do things that you know are proactive and use some of that to motivate people to do more security. You're onto something there that's pretty interesting. Uh, Steve, we're, we're at the end of our time. You want to go ahead and thanks for having us here at Dell Technologies and kind of wrap us up. And I will. Thank you, John. And I truly appreciate the panel and taking, taking our time and really enjoyed the conversation. It's been a great discussion. From a Dell Technologies perspective, uh, you can find us here, obviously, at the HIMSS booth 2000. And in addition to that, Dell Technologies slash healthcare is where you can find us out on the web. Be happy to have those conversations with you and bring our partners to bear as we talk about uh, healthcare and healthcare security. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone, for being here and for watching. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. And thanks so much.